My name is Julia Martin Lefebvre, and I have the huge honor and privilege to chair the Tyler Prize Executive Committee. So I want to just remind you that this is the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, and I'm putting a stress on the word achievement because it's the Tyler Prize recognizes, of course, great scientists in environmental fields, but it also recognizes, I shouldn't say but, and it recognizes uh, every bit as important the great science that's leading to change. We all know that we need to, we need to change. So our two laureates, who we are starting to celebrate just now, uh, uh, will be telling you about their great science and about the so what. What, are the, what? what is the achievement? What can we do to see change in our lives? So the Tyler Prize was established in 1972. It is really the oldest prize recognizing environment, work in the environment and environmental achievements. So it's 46 years old today. And as of right now, because officially you become laureates tomorrow evening, but when you get a very heavy medal and, but uh, officially now, uh, at this moment, we have had 74 individuals. We'll have 76 starting tomorrow evening and four organizations that have been recognized. And if you look on the website, you'll see that you two are standing on the shoulders of really great, great people and great organizations. Uh, so today what we're starting this celebration is that we're going to hear from our 2019 Environmental Achievement Laureates. Uh, I would like to introduce now the Tyler Prize Executive Committee. The Executive Committee looks after the entire endowment left by John and Alice Tyler, and it also acts as the jury for the Tyler Prize, the, the, which, which receives nominations. And so it's always a very difficult choice because we're very fortunate to have great people nominated. And of course, we always choose great people. So I think uh, I really appreciate a number of you have congratulated us, the Tyler Prize Executive Committee, for choosing our two laureates. So let me introduce them. So Rosina, may, let's hold the applause until afterwards. Rosina Bierbaum is one of our members. Maggie Catley Carlson, where are you, Maggie? There. Alan Kovic, Alan. Uh, Ezekiel Escura, Ezekiel is over there. You see we're mixing among you. Owen Lind, Owen has been on the committee since the beginning and he was a former chair. Judy McDowell, there's Judy. Ken Nielsen, where are you, Ken? Our newest member from the University of Southern California. Uh, Jonathan Patz, very good. And Kelly Sims Gallagher. Kelly, I've put Sims as your alphabetical name. Now you can give them an applause because they really work. <laughs> Very, very, very hard. So I'm going to have a very pleasant role now is to go down there and listen and maybe even ask questions. But let me introduce Jade Lavelle. There you are, Jade, who is a scientist by training, and she felt that science needs to be communicated. So she set up the Reagency Science Marketing Group because she said science needs a PR firm, and that's what you do. And we've, we're been, we've been working with Reagency to do just that. So Jade, over to you. Thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you, Julia. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone's morning been so far? Enjoyed your lunch? Yeah? Uh, has anyone seen Avengers? <laughs> A few. I'm glad because we wanted to, we planned to call this lecture Climate Change Endgame, but we found out that that name was already taken. <laughs> also because the battle to save the planet from the effects of climate change is far from over. It's not yet endgame. And it's not yet endgame partly because of the incredible efforts of the two Tyler Prize laureates that I'll introduce you to in just a moment. Uh, so instead, I'd like to, instead of end game, I want to introduce you to today's session, Climate Change, The Battle Continues. Now, I wouldn't be a millennial if I didn't point out that we have the Wi-Fi access details up on the screen. Um, also here is the hashtag. We will be taking questions in the panel afterwards, after the lectures. If you would like to ask a question, we're going to have these two mics here, but you're also welcome to tweet us a question, but please use that hashtag, TylerPrize2019. 
I should also point out, it would be a great time right now to follow the Tyler Prize on Twitter and Facebook. And if you would like to relive the joy of today's session, you can, uh, we'll be filming it and it will be posted on the Tyler Prize YouTube channel. So if you have your phones out, that's awesome. I'll assume that that's exactly what you're doing. Uh, now, as Julia said, my name is Jade Lovell. Um, I'm from a little island just off the coast of California here. It's called Australia. <laughs> and in addition to running reagency science marketing and sharing the good news about the Tyler Prize's work with the world, I'm also the host of the science show PsyQ on TYT Network. It's a show about science and politics and the role of scientific evidence in informing public policy decisions. Now, when we started that show back in 2014, uh, the US president was a man named Barack Obama. I see a few, uh, one member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, the last PCAST in existence here in the room. Um, and many people at the time said, Jade, why do you need a show about using science to make decisions? Of course people look at scientific evidence before they draft policies. Of course people listen to scientists. It's not like we have some sort of, I don't know, alternative facts out there. <laughs> How times change. I truly believe that the world can only make wise choices for all humanity when we're using all the scientific information we have available, which is one of the reasons why I'm so truly honoured and genuinely excited to host this year's Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement Laureate Lecture. Um, today we're going to have two lectures of about 15 minutes and then at one o'clock we'll have a Q&A panel. Um, please ask questions using the hashtag TylerPrize2019. Now, both of these laureates have personally inspired me during my very short career, both for their stunning and bold and insightful scientific work, but also for their frank and fearless commitment to science communication and getting the word out there about the work they do to the public. Now, Julia said that the Tyler Prize Executive Committee are the jury and they get to choose the laureates that uh, receive the prize and that's a very difficult job, but I like to think I have the most difficult job today because I have to condense their achievements down to under two minutes. We'll start with Dr. Washington. Now, when you think of climate science pioneers, you might think of Someone like Eunice Foote, who 163 years ago discovered the principal mechanisms that cause global climate change. Or you might think of Charles David Keeling, who is another Tyler Prize laureate, and his recordings of CO2 levels first alerted the world to the possibility of anthropogenic climate change. Or you might think of Dr. Warren Washington. Now, Dr. Washington's been a bold leader of climate science even before his career truly began. He was only the second African-American to receive a PhD in meteorology, ever. Before joining and eventually leading NCAR, um, oh, that was before he joined and then eventually led NCAR. Now, I thought computers began around the 1980s with the Apple II. <laughs> But it turns out that they existed in the 1960s. <laughs> and a young Dr. Washington had the idea of using this new technology to build a model of Earth's climate. Before that, we'd only really had models based on maths. Now, building this climate with a computer allowed us not only to predict future states of the atmosphere, but also to understand what would be called climate change. Not only that, but Dr. Washington literally wrote the book on climate modeling. His rigorous he's a rigorous scientist and has nearly 200 peer-reviewed published papers. And in addition to all of those achievements, he's advised six presidents, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, who also presented Warren with the 2019 National Medal of Science. Now, tomorrow, Dr. Washington will become the 76th Tyler Prize Laureate, but he has to leave pretty soon afterwards because he'll, be soon, uh, he'll soon have a building named after him at Penn State University, the Warren M. Washington Building. <laughs> May I introduce Dr. Washington?
Thank you for that very nice introduction. Uh, I really feel deeply honored to receive this, this award, but I have a lot of people to thank. Uh, thank to the family and, and Mary Washington, who's sitting right here, who keeps me straight. <laughs> the selection committee, Michael Manning for being a colleague to share this, this prize with. I've known and respected his work for a long time. And thanks to, to many of my NCAR colleagues. I think we were the, the fourth group that, that, that took on the challenge of building a computer model. And, and we now have a model that coordinates a major activity at NCAR involving NCAR and, and its colleagues in the academic com 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 community. So there's about 300 people now involved in this. And we use billions of hours of computer time. Thanks to earlier colleagues, uh, colleagues who had pioneered research. This is always important as we look back and see where the, uh, on, the, on the key achievements came from. <clears throat> and I want to also thank on the Tyler Prize staff. They've been excellent to, to work with. I'll just give an overview of the brief history of climate observations and computer modeling. And I'll present some estimates of 20th and 21st century climate change and the, and the public's views. <clears throat> I want to point out that John Tyner, uh, I mean Tyndall, excuse me, in 1861, we, with this apparatus, which is shown on the right side of the of the graph or of the graphics, was trying to explain on why, when we calculated surface temperature, that we always missed it in terms of getting on the right temperature. It was always thirty degrees too cold. So there was something missing, and that missing element was when he put carbon dioxide into his tube, it absorbed energy and emitted energy. And it solved the problem of, of being, uh, that there was absorption of infrared in energy <clears throat> and, that, and that, that needed to be included in, in the climate modeling error. <clears throat> if we didn't have that, that capability, we would have a much colder planet, this is, is basically uh, on the short story. So John Tyndall gave talks, even in 1861, in the U.S. and Europe and elsewhere, of this discovery. So it was generally accepted after people understood it, how he carried out the calculation. Uh, here I show the mathematical equations, which were essentially known since, since 1904 by V. Birkness on the upper right-hand corner. <clears throat> and then a, a, a relatively young scientist who didn't want to take part in World War I, uh, actively fighting from England. His name was L. F. Richardson. He did actually carry out this calculation as an ambulance driver because there was uh, episodic wars when people came out of the trenches and fought hard. And then it was quiet for maybe weeks at a time. Anyway, he tried to solve these equations, but uh, his, his attempt to actually failed because the amount of mathematics involved was too, too large. And also, there were some assumptions he made that were in error. And then uh, the, the, the electronic computer became available in the late 40, 1940s. And one of the first problems that were put on the computer was forecasting on the weather. Now, those same equations were modified a bit. <clears throat> so you can start, start looking at climate change and, and climate. <clears throat> 
I started using computers, electronic computers, in, in, in the late 1950s. I got a job as a mathematician at Stanford for a summer job, and it was, uh, it was in a group that was considering making a computer model of the atmosphere. <clears throat> so I asked them at the end of the summer, where can I go to get a PhD? And I ended up, ended up at uh, Penn State University working with a very bright pro professor there. Uh, I show here a vertical grid going from the ground and taking into account the shape of the, of the mountains and then it goes up in the, into the stratosphere. And then on the far right, the time that I was initially involved, uh, you can see that, uh, that there were, like in the 1960s, some attempt to do atmospheric and land surface modeling and simple ocean modeling. I won't go through the details of this, but if you go over to the far right, that we've added more features such as sulfate aerosols, carbon cycle, dust and sea spray, carbon aerosols, <clears throat> interactive with the vegetation, biochemicals, cycles, and now ice sheets over Greenland and <clears throat> Antarctica. So things have really improved in terms of the detail that we had. But even with our earlier models, we were able to get a good estimate of climate change. <clears throat> and we experimented with different types of grids, latitude and longitude grids, uh, cube sphere, essentially looking like a soccer ball, spherical ge geodesic, and, uh, uh, grids and so forth, and we've actually built that into our models. Uh, so if we use high resolution versions of our model at 25 k k kilometers, it gets down to the, to the resolution of a county. <clears throat> and that's what we use for our high resolution uh, simulations. And the processes that we use <clears throat> are shown in this schematic. I won't go through them in detail, but basically clouds, ocean circulation, river flow, precipitation. Uh, 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 in the Arctic regions, we have snow cover. And in the mid-latitudes, of course, that we have snow cover <clears throat> in the higher elevations. And then we have different types of clouds. I won't go through all the types and then all of the, but we include the ocean temp, uh, ocean sea ice and, and so forth. And that these models actually reproduce the atmosphere reasonably well, even, even give us in, uh, simulations of El Nino, and, and other natural fluctuations in the climate system. And then we can actually look at the ice core <clears throat> uh, data and see that the planet goes in and out of ice ages um, fairly regularly uh, on the order of 50 or 60,000 year periods. <clears throat> And you see up in the upper right-hand corner an arrow, and that's where our carbon dioxide is right now. So we could really go back to 800,000 years ago and not see uh, a, a carbon dioxide uh, amount of a con concentration that's anywhere close to how about we have now. So that we're in the, sort of a new era. <clears throat> and you can see here uh, this sort of 10 indicators of a warming world where you have water vapor increasing, air temperature, ocean temperature, uh, ocean heat content, <clears throat> sea surface temperature, sea ice, and then in the mountains we have... Uh, the glaciers shrinking, snow cover going down, and all of these are fairly well known. 
<clears throat> so anyway, these are our 10 indicators of a warming world. I've even done some kind of strange things. And on the next one is that I was, I was, I had published a paper and it was picked up by Newsweek Time and Time Magazine. And then I got a call from the, the, uh, the uh, chief of staff for the first group, Bush. Uh, John Sununu called me at home when I got home from a meeting. And it was kind of interesting that uh, he asked me, uh, how do you solve your equations? Are you using finite differences, spectral, or finite element methods? I knew that this wasn't the typical type of, of conversation with, with uh, people. It turned out that he had done his, his PhD at MIT solving the equations of a very similar type. Well, <clears throat> the science advisor, Alan Bromley, uh, asked me to, to spend some time seeing him in his office, but he didn't tell me what he wanted to ask me for. And what he wanted was me to give him a climate model he could run on his compact 30, 386 computer. <laughs> <clears throat> and I told him that the, that the code is too large. It was like one, our codes in those days were roughly a million lines of code. And that uh, he can't do it. So we gave him a simplified model that he could play with. And anyway, it was, a, it was an interesting time. And the New York Times and the Washington Post wanted to know about what's going on, and I didn't want to embarrass on the, on the administration by exposing it. But it came out later, anyway. You know, these, these things get out. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, uh, the thing that he, he pr proposed was actually an error, and I tried to correct him to it. But I don't think I changed his mind. Now, another person who had a different per persuasion <laughs> was uh, UK's Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, who, who was on her way to Aspen from England. And she wanted to, to be, be given a, a, a briefing by me on her trip. So this was very tricky because uh, NCAR is kind of an open place. And to sort of see guards all over the place with uh, attack rifles, uh, making sure that the prime minister was safe. Um, and I, sh I, f I found this picture of her pointing her finger because at the end of my talk, it turned out that she had gone to Oxford and got a degree in, in chemistry and, and, and biology. So she asked an enormous number of questions. And I, I had view graphs in those days. It wasn't PowerPoint like now. And her science advisor stood up and said, uh, it's time to go to the next appointment. And she pointed at my slide and says, we're not leaving here until I see every one of them. <laughs> so everybody sat back down. <clears throat> Now, another story I want to tell is, is here's something that was published in the New York Times just a, a few, 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 few months back, showing, or, or a year or so ago, 2017, where 300 million, uh, I mean, billion of money was spent in dealing with all of these natural disasters, including earthquakes and so forth. But the biggest ones were from flooding and tropical storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, and so forth. And, and you can see the, just looking at the, at the graph, you can, you can see that most of this takes place in the, in the southeast part of the, of the country. 
and it's going to get probably worse. Every evening when you turn on the, the, the television to listen to the evening's news, there's usually some feature there about bad weather or extreme weather. And for us climate scientists, this is not surprising. This is, is what we would expect. <clears throat> I want to show here uh, our, one of our latest simulations of the evolution of, of water vapor and sea ice and sea surface temperatures in one graphic. Now, now this goes for one year, and it shows the present day at the top and the future of essentially on the last decade of for, for the future. And this is kind of using something called RCP 8.5, which is basically on the worst case scenario. What you're seeing is, and it may be a little bit subtle, is that in the, in the future's climate, we're going to get much stronger water vapor content in the atmosphere, which is going to affect uh, the surface temperature. It's going to affect on the, on the warming. And how this works is as the ocean warms up, it evaporates more moisture. You get more water vapor, and there's more feedback on the climate system. So this is what we call the positive feedback. And it will, will lead to stronger storm systems. Uh, and uh, when we look at this in more detail, uh, we find that the storms are going to be stronger just because they have more water vapor in them. And that they propagate further into the inland areas, so over, over the Gulf area and in, in the southern states, eastern states, we're going to see stronger uh, storm systems causing more havoc. And I want to just end up here talking about pluralistic solutions. If you have geoengineering and Green New Deal, uh, and carbon tax, and energy efficiency, and nuclear energy. And there's a report that just came out of negative emission technologies and reliable sequestration in this new Academy report is to actually see all of these uh, sort of taking place. And if there's any questions, I can try to answer them. Uh, but I just want to list how we might uh, improve our research and technology solutions to solving this problem. But we, we're going to have to also change minds that are, are, are and make it clear that people who deny that climate change is happening are fooling the American public and the world's public. Thank you. And I just want to show this final picture. It's of a child, and it's, and it's, and it's America, and, and his, his or her face has got the, the, the world painted, painted on it. It is that this generation is likely to have the biggest effect of, of climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Washington, for that incredible primer on all we know about climate change. When I found out that we were going to be awarding these two laureates together, I was thrilled because they make a really good pair of past and present and future climate science. Dr. Michael E. Mann will become the 77th Tyler Prize laureate tomorrow. Now, I first became aware of Dr. Mann's work way back when I was a college student uh, because he'd released a little scientific figure that became known as the hockey stick graph. 
The hockey stick graph is perhaps the most controversial figure in modern environmental science, and we were debating it in my college class. Dr. Mann pioneered techniques to use proxy data, such as uh, ice cores and tree rings, to reconstruct the Earth's climate. And one of my colleagues asked me, why would you do that? It's because we didn't have accurate climate models, uh, climate uh, we didn't have accurate measurements of the Earth's temperature back before about 100 years ago because thermometers didn't exist. So we had to go back and recreate Earth's climate in order to understand whether the change we are seeing today is uh, historical, uh, is, a really, uh, is a difference in the, in the pattern compared to Earth's climate. In addition to being a fellow of the American Geophysical a geophysical union and a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. Dr. Michael E. Mann is a distinguished professor at Penn State's College of Earth and Mineral Science. He's the author of over 200 peer-reviewed publications. And it takes a certain kind of brilliance to have contributed so much to this very difficult era, area of climate science, but it requires absolute fearlessness to have stood up for climate science bodily defending the entire science community from the relentless attacks of special interest groups. Uh, Mike doesn't know this, but we marched side by side in the science march two years ago. And perhaps his biggest achievement is having over 100,000 followers on Twitter, where he makes time to share climate science and debate climate scientists, uh, climate, climate deniers on a regular basis. Dr. Michael E. Mann. Thank you very much. Well, I, I want to thank, uh, uh, first of all, um, uh, Warren. It's, it's so wonderful to share this prize with you. Uh, you're a, a true hero of mine, and it's, it's especially meaningful uh, to be able to, to share this occasion uh, with my hero, Warren Washington. Uh, I want to thank the Tyler uh, Executive Committee, the Tyler Foundation, uh, for recognizing our efforts, and uh, all my friends and family who are here in the audience for the support that they've provided over the years. Um, so I'm going to talk a, a little bit about my experiences in the, the front lines of uh, the battle, uh, the battle to avert catastrophic climate change. Uh, the first point here, and Warren already really drove this home, uh, the, the basics are well understood. Uh, the, the underlying science of human-caused climate change goes back actually nearly two centuries. Joseph Fourier, in essence, understood there was a greenhouse effect that warms the planet. And so over the last two centuries, we have essentially been refining our understanding of the science. But the basics, it goes back two centuries. It's not debated. The fact that we are increasing the concentrations of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, well, this is a plot that I put together for a TED Talk uh, uh, 10 years ago. And that's where we were 10 years ago. See that red dot? That's where we are now unprecedented. We are engaged in this unprecedented experiment with the one planet that we know in the universe that can support life. And what we wouldn't be able to explain, given the fundamental nature of our scientific understanding, would be if the Earth were not warming up. But of course, the observations tell us that it is warming up. It's warmed up a little more than a degree Celsius, degree and a half Fahrenheit. Um, and pretty soon, we will cross a degree and a half Celsius, two degrees Celsius, if we don't take action. Uh, we know that the warming is due to human activity. Uh, in fact, if we only put the natural factors into the models, they tell us that the, the planet should have actually cooled over the last half century. So when the IPCC concludes that human influence, it's extremely likely that, the, that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming, here, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is being its characteristically conservative self because, in fact, we are responsible for more than 100% of the warming that has been seen because we offset a small cooling trend uh, in the opposite direction that would have arisen from the natural factors that are at work. Um, so what about our future? Well, if we take action, there's still time to avert uh, warming of a degree and a half Celsius or two degrees Celsius, which are two thresholds that are often talked about these days when it comes to uh, averting catastrophic climate change. But if we continue on the course that we're on, 
then by the end of the century, we will warm the planet more than four to five degrees Celsius. Uh, that's seven to nine degrees Fahrenheit uh, warming of the planet. And the impacts would be catastrophic. Now, it's not just about polar bears and penguins, um, although they do drive home you know, the, the, the fundamental threat that we pose to the planet with our continued reliance on fossil fuels. It's not just about the polar bears and the penguins. It's about unprecedented floods and droughts and heat waves and wildfires. And I'm just talking about California over the last year and a half. <laughs> um, that's the face of climate change. The impacts of climate change are no longer subtle. Um, as Warren alluded to, we are seeing them play out um, on a daily basis on our television screens, in our newspaper headlines, in our social media feeds. So why haven't we acted to the extent that's necessary to avert catastrophe? Well, it's a rhetorical question. We sort of know the answer to that. Um, climate change and the science of climate change poses a fundamental threat to the world's most powerful industry and, and the wealthiest industry, the fossil fuel industry. Um, our findings are inconvenient to those who would like to see us continue in our addiction to fossil fuels. And so they have often uh, used their immense wealth and power um, to attack the science, to undermine public faith in science, to influence politicians, to prevent them from acting on science. Uh, in the wonderful book, Merchants of Doubt, by my friends and colleagues, uh, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, since made into a film, uh, they describe how the same tactics that were used to sow doubt in the linkage between tobacco and human health are now being used to sow doubt in our understanding of the threat of continued fossil fuel burning. Now, I found myself in the center of this contentious battle uh, because of this curve that we published literally two decades ago now, uh, the hockey stick curve, because it told a simple story. You didn't need to understand the complex workings of Earth's climate system to understand what this picture is telling us, that we are engaged in an unprecedented experiment with this planet. Uh, it got a name, the hockey stick, it was featured in the summary for policymakers of the 2001 IPCC report. It became an icon in the climate change debate, and as a result of that, uh, it was attacked by those um, interest groups and individuals looking to discredit the case for concern about climate change. Uh, and it doesn't matter that today there's a veritable hockey league. There are dozens of estimates that have been performed that all come to the same conclusion, that the recent warming um, is unprecedented as far back as we can go. Um, and the hockey stick does remain this icon in the climate change debate. And it continues to be uh, attacked, again, by those looking to discredit the case for concern. If they could just somehow invalidate the hockey stick, the entire weight of evidence for human-caused climate change would come crashing down like a house of cards. Of course, that's silly. There's so many independent lines of evidence that tell us that we're warming the planet in an unprecedented manner. But if you can take an, a symbol, an icon, and discredit it, um, then you can try to make the cynical case that you have introduced doubt and uncertainty into the equation. Um, some would call this the politicization of science. I prefer a different term, the scientization of politics, which is something that to me is even more pernicious. It's the way that science is now used um, to wage politics. If you don't like you know, the science as assessed by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences or every scientific society in the U.S. or Europe or around the world that have weighed in, climate change is real, it's human-caused, it poses a threat. If you don't like that, well, there's an alternative universe, um, networks, television networks that uh, uh, sort of uh, attempt to convince you that climate change is a hoax uh, perpetrated by the Chinese, um, that the laws of physics don't uh, apply, and attempt to present an alternative uh, universe of alternative facts um, that, uh, again, uh, conflict with what the science actually tells us. Uh, so I found myself in the center of those uh, efforts, um, the, the disinformation uh, campaign to discredit climate change because of the hockey stick. And I tell that story in my book, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars. And I'm not going to go through all of the, the stories, uh, all of the uh, experiences and adventures that I have uh, experienced as a as a result of this, but I will talk about one matter. Uh, back in 2009, um, uh, Ken Cuccinelli, who was a Tea Party Republican Attorney General for Virginia, um, wanted to subpoena all of my personal emails from the time I had been a faculty member at the University of Virginia, so he could find something in there to try to embarrass or discredit me and, and uh, satisfy his fossil fuel funders. Uh, well, there was an overwhelming um, reaction to that by the scientific community uh, pushing back against this assault on science. The Washington Post uh, published no less than five editorials denouncing Ken Cuccinelli's witch hunt uh, against me and the University of Virginia. 
Uh, their award-winning uh, cartoonist, uh, Tom Tolles, weighed in on the matter not once, but twice. Um, and I have to say, this is my favorite. I don't mind being compared to Galileo. That's OK. Uh, I'm, I approve. Um, in fact, I so approve. I so approve of that that I decided to go on and uh, write a book with Tom Tolles, uh, using his cartoons to, to tell this story about climate change and the threat it, impo uh, it poses and the need to get past this bad faith a debate about whether the problem exists. Well, uh, Ken Cuccinelli ultimately lost um, in the lower court uh, on a technicality. He had failed to provide evidence of uh, wrongdoing on my part in his 40-page filing to the court. Uh, so they, uh, they rejected his subpoena. He appealed to the state Supreme Court, which uh, a couple years later ruled against him with prejudice, meaning they never want to see an attorney general come back to the court with something like this again. So that was a battle that was won, but uh, undeterred. Ken Cuccinelli ran for governor of Virginia in the next election. Um, I campaigned actively with his opponent, uh, Terry McAuliffe, who won. He won the election, and uh, poor Ken Cuccinelli, um, in defeat, he went off to uh, help run an oyster farm on Tangier Island, an island in the Chesapeake Bay that is slowly succumbing to the effects of global sea level rise. Uh, I'm, I'm not making this up, folks. You can Google this. You, you know, you just can't make this stuff up. Well. But don't uh, become too complacent. Um, he has been named um, as a potential replacement for the, uh, uh, to run the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, what's the greatest threat that our military tells us um, uh, we currently face when it comes to national security and conflict? Climate change. It's what they call a threat multiplier. It takes existing conflicts and tensions and amplifies them. So, of course, it would be a disaster to have somebody who doesn't even accept the reality of the problem lead that. But that's where we are. Um, in this uh, current environment, we have a president who has uh, built a wall between himself and the science of climate change. And we will all pay for it, by the way, if he has his way. We face this monumental um, threat. Uh, a, a president, a, a, an executive branch, an administration that rejects the science of climate change and has you know, uh, put in place a, a virtual dream team of fossil fuel lobbyists and, uh, and, uh, and, and climate change deniers to run his administration. Well, what can we do in the face of this threat? Well, we can speak out. We, can, we have a voice. And, 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 and uh, here, uh, those of us in this room today understand uh, the importance of using that voice in whatever way we can to impact the larger conversation. And so, as uh, Jade mentioned, I was uh, out on the front lines marching in the streets, as many of my uh, science colleagues have been doing at the Science March a couple years ago to, um, to raise awareness for the threat posed by an administration that does not accept what science has to say when it comes to the leading challenges we face, like climate change. Uh, and I was at the front of that line with, the, there's this guy with a bow tie um, who's next to me, sort of annoying guy. Uh, <laughs> Now, it's uh, my good friend uh, Bill Nye, uh, the, the science guy who was helping uh, lead uh, this, this march and raising awareness for the threat. Uh, and we all have a voice. We need to use that voice. To me, what gives me the most op uh, optimism, though, is uh, the voice of the young people, um, the, the youth climate movement, uh, the fact that the, the children who, as Warren said, are the ones who have the, the, the most to uh, lose if we don't uh, confront this challenge. They are literally changing the conversation by striking, by being out there in the streets, raising awareness, demanding accountability of the adults in the world who have an opportunity to influence our decisions so that we don't leave behind a degraded planet for children and grandchildren. And we need to do everything we can to, to support that effort um, because they can't do this alone. Uh, a couple weeks ago, a number of colleagues and I uh, published a, a letter in the journal Science um, expressing concern for what these young folks are doing. And it's really important we get behind them. We help them um, in this uh, effort to preserve the planet for future generations. And here, this is a photo of my daughter and a, a polar bear. And I promise we're not uh, torturing our daughter. This is uh, the Pittsburgh Zoo. There's a, 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 a plexiglass tube that you can walk underneath the polar bear uh, feeding pool. And if you happen to know the director of the zoo because you're involved in an NSF-funded project to uh, develop <laughs> climate change outreach materials for zoos and aquaria, you might be able to convince them to throw the fish in the pool when your daughter is walking through, which is <laughs> what's happening here. But, um, you know, this is about what sort of world we want to leave behind. Um, 
Great Barrier Reef, 93% uh, of, uh, of the, the reef uh, was bleached in the most recent bleaching event. Warming oceans and the acidification of the CO2 buildup in the atmosphere and ocean, which is literally threatening the world's coral reefs. Uh, in fact, a couple years ago, um, sort of half jokingly, uh, half, only half in jest, um, um, there was a, a, an obituary um, that was published for the Great Barrier Reef because we will see the death of the Great Barrier Reef in a matter of years if we don't act on this problem now. And that's simply symbolic of, of the loss of, of the beauty and wonder uh, of this planet that we will suffer if we don't act on this problem. And it really is about future generations, what sort of planet we want to leave behind for them. Um, to me, it is very much about my daughter who's here in the second row, who's 13 years old, uh, um, what sort of planet we want to leave behind for her, her children, her grandchildren. There is still an opportunity to make sure that we don't leave behind a degraded planet uh, for future generations. Um, so there is agency. We can affect um, the way this story turns out but there is urgency as well. We must act now. Uh, and quite literally, as my friend Al Gore uh, has said, um, you know, the earth literally does lie in the balance. And so I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Dr. Mann, thank you so much for mentioning my country, Australia. Since tourism is a huge part of our economy, um, you should all go and visit the reef. Um, it might be gone soon, so now's your chance. Um, now we've got to the Q&A part of, our pan of this uh, event today. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Washington to our panel. And also, uh, on behalf of the Tyler Prize, uh, Dr. Kelly Sims Gallagher. She's Professor of Energy and Environmental Policy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. <coughs> she also directs the Climate Policy Lab and the Center for International Environment and Re uh, Environment Resources. Uh, Environment and Resource Policy at Fletcher. Um, she's just released a book which is incredible called Titans of, the, Titans of the Climate, Explaining Policy Process in the US and China to True Titans of Climate. Um, but before we get into the questions, I just wanted to set the scene by showing you this little snippet of Dr. Mann when he was testifying and being interrogated by the former House Science Chair, Lamar Smith, in 2017. Uh, according to an article that came out a few days ago in the journal Science, uh, Chairman Smith was on record at the Heartland Institute. This is a climate change denying Koch Brothers funded uh, outlet um, that has a climate change denier conference every year. And uh, Chairman Smith spoke at that conference. Dr. Mann, don't mischaracterize that. Well, let me, let me finish uh, my... No, they do not say that they are deniers and you should not say that they are either. Well, uh, we, we can have that discussion. I'd be happy to. Let well, me finish my statement. Well, be accurate in your description. Well, I, I stand by my statement, but can I finish my uh, uh, point? I'd like to reclaim uh, my time. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, he uh, indicated at this conference that he, according to science, and I'm quoting from them, he sees his role on this committee as to a tool to advance his political agenda rather than a forum to examine important issues facing the U.S. research community. As a scientist, I find that deeply disturbing. Uh, Dr. Mann, who said that? Uh, this is according to Science Magazine, uh, one of the most respected um, and, outlets and, when it comes and to science. And who are they quoting? Um, this is the, uh, the author, uh, Jeffrey Mervis, who wrote that article. I c I'd be happy to send to committee the, okay. uh, the article. Uh, that is not known as an objective writer or magazine. Well, it's Science Magazine. Yeah, <laughs> Before Kelly starts us off with the first question to the panel, I just remind you that there are microphones here if you would like to ask a question from the audience, or please uh, use the hashtag TylerPrize2019. Kelly. So, Mike, I think after watching that testimony, <laughs> that the obvious first question for us is what really is the role of scientists, both social scientists and physical scientists, in informing public policy decisions today? Well, thanks uh, for the question. And it, it, when, when that, you play that video, the problem is that last statement of Lamar Smith is so outrageous that the audience laughs and they don't hear my response, which is, it's Science Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, that role is to inform uh, these, uh, you know, the conversation about the great challenges that we face. And it was a Republican president, in fact, uh, Abraham Lincoln, 
back in the you know, mid-1800s who recognized the, the need for a, an academy. The National Academy of Sciences was founded by Republican President Abraham Lincoln um, so that there was an avenue for informing uh, you know, policy-relevant science. Um, and uh, I wrote an op-ed a, a few years ago in the New York Times, the title of which is, If You See Something, Say Something, which, of course, draws from our Department of Homeland Security's motto, uh, as scientists, we see this threat. And if we fail to speak out and to inform the public discourse about this threat, we leave a vacuum that will be filled by the voices of misinformation and disinformation, those who have an agenda to advance, those who have an ax to grind. And so um, it is essential, uh, not that we weigh in with you know, our views about policy prescriptions uh, for, for, for solving this problem. I believe there's a worthy debate to be had about how we go about solving this problem. But there isn't a worthy debate to be had about whether the problem exists. And we can't tolerate the continued promotion of the idea that there is a debate. And there is a, a happy ending to this story. In the longer version of this lecture, I play that video, and then I point out that now, um, you know, a couple years later, uh, we have a House of Representatives that is in uh, Democratic hands. We have a, a wonderful chair, uh, Eddie Bernice Johnson, African-American woman, uh, trained as a, um, you know, in medical science, mm -hmm. um, who is taking a very proactive uh, role um, uh, with the Science Committee. And in their most recent hearing, about climate change, the Republicans on that committee did not challenge the science of climate change. Um, and with this shift in the political winds, with figures like AOC and the GND, um, uh, you have uh, Republicans who are increasingly fearful that if they don't come to the table and engage in the worthy debate to be had about what to do about this problem, they're going to get a policy solution that they don't like. And so whether or not we do get a Green New Deal or anything that looks like the Green New Deal, it's already had this impact of shifting the conversation back where it should be. And so I, um, I have some optimism with the children's youth movement, with the shift in our politics, with the fact that Republicans are coming to the table now, even with a climate change denying president, I have some optimism that uh, there, we're ready to confront this challenge now. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if I could just add add to it in that last slide, or just before the end. I did list a whole bunch of things that are ongoing research objectives to look towards solutions to the problem. Mm -hmm. And at least my sort of gut reaction is that, is that there is not going to be any one single solution and that we need to pursue many different ones and sort of take advantage of, of the expertise and the knowledge, not only of the government scientists, but of the private sector and so forth in dealing with this problem. And we should get on to it quickly. We don't need to argue about, as, as Michael said, if there is uh, sort of a, a, a whole bunch of doubt about climate change. In fact, if you look at, at the latest surveys, roughly 70% of the American public agrees that something is changing and, and then we ought to start doing something about it. So I, I just don't understand why some of the politicians have steadfastly stuck with this view that we can't do anything about it, and it's not that bad, or it's not not very important. I think that we need to worry about our next generations if we're going to help them live in a different world. Just as a follow-up question to your statement, Dr. Washington, about 70% of the US public now believes in climate change, uh, we often hear from those who don't that the U.S. is only one country, and why should we, the U.S., have to bear the burden and the economic cost of uh, fixing this climate change problem? Um, this is a question to both of you, but also to Kelly as well, with expertise in China and the U.S. What role does the United States play in climate policy, and can we have success without the United States? Well, the, the first thing to say is that the U.S. is intrinsically important as a major emitter. Um, it, it 
has been historically the largest emitter for many decades, just recently eclipsed by China. But on a cumulative uh, historical basis, actually Europe is the largest cumulative emitter. The United States slow, right behind it. Uh, and China is just beginning, um, if you look, going all the way back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So the US needs to be part of the solution. And the good news is that at the state level, many states are stepping up. Um, and I think many companies now are really making a big difference, universities. So we have lots of different elements of civil society taking action. So we, we don't need to despair, though it's not enough. I mean, we really do need, in my view, uh, federal policy. Um, but the US has also been historically important in the international uh, negotiations because ultimately we do need to have uh, a global agreement and we were fortunate to get one with the Paris Agreement on Climate Change in 2015. Um, and I think, you know, even though President Trump has announced his intention to withdraw, it's very important for everyone to know that the U.S. cannot actually withdraw from the Paris Agreement until the day after the next presidential election. <laughs> and true story. So um, if you are wondering if this election matters, it does. And I think it's very important to recognize that um, all the other countries that committed to the Paris Agreement are still in. China announced it would remain in and it would adhere to its commitments. I published an article two weeks ago in Nature Communications showing that China is actually on track to peak early um, to achieve its commitments ahead of schedule. Uh, I think the rest of the world is just waiting for us to come back, and then we can get on with you know, the next phase, which is uh, more ambitious targets in, in the international arena. Do you want to add to that? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, uh, you know, it, it's interesting we're having this conversation in California, and of course California has taken a, a real leadership role. Um, and in fact, it was in part the effort by uh, uh, the former governor and friend of mine, uh, Jerry Brown, um, who uh, helped uh, negotiate with China uh, to bring them with the table. And of course, um, this uh, monumental bilateral agreement between uh, China and, and the US, which you were involved in, the two largest emitters, which set the stage for, for Paris. Um, well, Pennsylvania is the latest state. Um, just the other day, they announced that they are joining a coalition of more than 20 states that are committed to pricing carbon, incentivizing renewable energy. Uh, more than 30% of the US population is in one of those states. So we already have, just through the efforts at the local level, at the state level, and through these consortia of states, um, a, a fundamental uh, commitment uh, by uh, many of, of the people of this country and, and policymakers to solving this problem. We have industry working with us. Um, the fact is, in my understanding, you know, China is on its way to meeting its commitments ahead of time, and we are on our way uh, to coming at least pretty close to meeting our commitments, even in the absence of any presidential leadership, just because of the progress that's being made at the, at the local level, the state level, by our largest companies. Imagine what we could do if we had a president who was actually working to further that cause rather than reverse all of the progress that we've made in recent decades, um, uh, progress under both uh, Republican and Democratic administrations. Um, that is being reversed right now by this administration. So once again, when it comes to this issue of agency, we have great agency when it comes to electing our policymakers. And we saw that with the last election. We moved about halfway back <laughs> uh, to where we need to be. Um, if we see a, a similar sort of level of engagement by the American people in this next presidential election, um, then we can actually return to, um, to, to taking the leadership role that we once took when it comes to combating this problem. I just if I can, can I add one thing? I think it's really interesting. I mean, Dr. Washington just made this point that we have a super majority of Americans that support climate action. Uh, but up until recently, I think it's fair to say they weren't voting on climate. And I think we are turning the tide right now, largely because of the activism of young people I think this is going to be the first election, first presidential election, where, where people are actually going to be voting on climate. And that might make all the difference. Let me just add one quick point. <laughs> a poll that just came out uh, yesterday, or the day before yesterday, showing that climate change is the leading issue right now in the Democratic primary. It's the leading issue on the, the minds of at least Democratic voters. We've never seen that before. Never. Yeah.
Yeah. <laughs> Just a reminder to please come up to the microphones if you have a question, but uh, I'll add one more. Um, speaking of presidents, Dr. Washington, you've advised six US presidents. Has climate change always been a political issue? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if I can just mention two situations, back in at the time of, of the 1970s and so, there was a lot of, <clears throat> of disagreement uh, in the science com community about is it, is it warming due to the sun getting stronger? Is it, is it warming because uh, some of our satellites were showing a cooling trend Things like that, uh, and there was some some doubt uh, uh, about either a cooling planet or, or a warming planet. Well, <clears throat> on the research that came after that, uh, from the satellites, from from other observations, and so forth, we've been able to put pieces to the to the to the climate puzzle together. And, and see that the solar intensity of, uh, you know, sort of, you know, stronger sunlight had not warmed up the planet because it was, it was pretty much the same as it was uh, in the early 1970s and 1980s. So that one by one on the other sort of arguments about cooling or warming of the planet have been settled. And uh, we, you know, this is a good sort of demonstration of, of how science works, is that we're able to kind of look at the data and, and look at it carefully. And we get the, on the types of data that can help us you know, on the policy side. So at this point, as, as Michael has pointed out, we have a pretty good group, uh, a few of all of the major factors that determine climate change. And we can really pin down on what the real cause is, and that is that we're emitting too much carbon dioxide and other, other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And we've got to turn things around. And that's why on this new Academy report, is looking at trying to estimate uh, on the technologies needed to have, in a sense, negative emissions and bring things back to, to where they should be. I just hope one day we're giving the Tyler Prize to someone who has found the technology to reach negative emissions. Yeah. We'll start with a question over here. Hey, thank you so much um, for being here and, and for your talk and, of course, your life's work. <laughs> um, so as you pointed out, the models you've been building for decades have come true. Um, and so I think now maybe part of the political reaction is that politicians are being forced to deal with the effects of climate change, not the theory of climate change. So one of my concerns is that the focus is spent on uh, building resilience and climate adaptation without seeing greenhouse gas mitigation as part of that defense. So I guess from a scientist's perspective, how do you continue to communicate the importance of reducing emissions as part of adaptation strategies? You want to take that? Sure, sure. I'm happy to start out with that. Um, so uh, our former presidential science advisor, John Holdren, who's a good friend of a number of us here in the audience, um, I, I thought framed it uh, very well uh, some years ago when he said, you know, how we respond to climate change is going to be a combination of three things, mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. And it's up to us to determine how much of each of those is appropriate, is acceptable. Um, I personally would like to minimize the suffering. Uh, we are going to need to engage in a certain amount of adaptation simply because of the changes that are already baked in, the additional sea level rise that's already going to happen. Um, so we do have to uh, put in place uh, you know, ad adaptive measures to deal with the, the increased threat that we face. That having been said, we have to mitigate those changes that we still can. 
uh, and that involves bringing down our carbon emissions. You know, the, there was a recent uh, special report of the IPCC that's been pop, you know, commonly summarized as we have 12 years left to act on this problem. Now, that's a, a bit um, glib in the way that it sort of uh, summarizes where we are, but basically the point that it's making is that if we are to prevent burning through the carbon budget, the amount of carbon that we can afford to burn and still keep warming below a degree and a half, let alone two degrees Celsius, uh, which is where we see the worst impacts of climate change uh, begin to happen. Um, we have to lower our carbon emissions by about 5% a year um, for the next 12 years and beyond. And if, with each year of relative inaction where our emissions don't come down at all, well, we're going to have to accelerate that even further. So it's important to recognize that there is a role for adaptation. And interestingly, it sometimes brings people to the table. Um, people, you know, who might be contrarians when it comes to climate change, uh, uh, taking action on climate change. If you can throw them a bone, you talk about, you know, adaptation, something that they feel they can get on board with because it doesn't have the same connotations, uh, then, um, you, you know, it's a foot in the door and then maybe you can get them to, to make the commitment that's necessary to really tackling this problem, which indeed involves mitigation. One of the things that gives me optimism in states, um, you know, and the question sort of alludes to this. Uh, in Florida, you know, Republicans don't have the luxury of denying the impacts of climate change because the people they represent are dealing with the impacts on a day-to-day -day basis. And so you have people like Matt Gates who is um, one of the most conservative uh, uh, congressional Republicans, Donald Trump's biggest supporter. Um, you probably recognize him. Um, and uh, just the other day, um, he said, you know, we've got to stop denying, I'm not going to argue with a thermometer, is what he said. We've got to stop arguing against the evidence. We've got to come to the table and talk about the, the solutions here. And their governor, um, uh, Rob uh, De, De, De Santis, um, who many thought uh, would be a disaster when it comes to uh, issues like climate change because of his previously expressed views and policies, it turns out um, is taking a very, very proactive approach to dealing with climate change and appointing to his cabinet um, leading scientists uh, from the University of Florida and elsewhere. Uh, it's been a pleasant surprise. Um, and so there is this hint, and I alluded to it in my presentation, that maybe we're turning um, the corner on the politics of this issue, despite the oppressive atmosphere of a president that denies climate change. Maybe we're turning the corner. And that gives, you know, along with the action of young people and all the other positive developments, it gives me some optimism. Can I just add, I think one really important thing to recognize is a lot of the measures that we can take that are good for mitigation are also good for adaptation. So I don't think we need to worry so much about either or, you know, that this is a zero-sum game. Uh, just to give two examples, you know, reforestation, really good, it absorbs CO2, and it often has an adaptive or resiliency uh, impact because it prevents mudslides when you have a, a strong storm. A lot of cases, distributed renewable energy, obviously that's good from a mitigation point of view, uh, but also, you know, we've done some work in some small island states, and it helps um, nations be able to bounce back after a storm if they have power that can come back on more quickly. So these are just two examples where you can achieve win-win solutions, adaptation and mitigation benefits with the same intervention. We have about 10 minutes left for questions, so we'll take this one over here. I'm Matthias Wackernagel with Global Footprint Network, and thank you all, particularly Dr. Mann and Dr. Washington, for the inspiration. Um, there has been a wonderful fresh wind now with Greta coming on the stage. Um, we, I'm from Switzerland originally. Their local elections have started to swing around, and even conservative news says it's because of Greta that now much more environmental issues and environmental candidates come to the forefront. And it's also wonderful how they use the conflict between schools and students. You know, schools are supposed to keep students in, and the students want to go out. So to make that into a conflict made it very media interesting, the story, and it's not just left right. So I think it's wonderful. But at the same time, probably these school strikes, they can't go on forever. So I just wonder what would be your advice to the younger generation, but also to us older people, uh, how to use the momentum and to turn that into a winning strategy. Well, 
let me state, uh, I've got a daughter who's on a two-day school strike right now because she's out here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pre-approved uh, school strike. Um, <laughs> Uh, but she's actually the same age as Alexandria Vilsener, um, who is, uh, along with Greta, sort of the leading figures in the children's uh, climate movement who have been striking, you know, these Fridays for the future, um, striking to raise awareness about climate change. And it's changed the whole conversation. It's remarkable. Uh, I think it, it is part of why we are turning the corner. Um, but, of course, they are not in a position to solve this problem alone. Um, they can't even vote. Um, they're not in positions of authority and power. Um, so the influence that they can have is by forcing the adults in the world to act on their behalf, to be agents on their behalf, and to ensure that we do hold our policymakers accountable. Elections do have consequences. We've seen that. Um, we have to make climate a voting issue in this next election. It appears to be poised to be a voting issue in this next election. Um, we have to take the sort of um, headwind that these younger folks have provided us to take advantage of this pivotal moment to put even more pressure on our politicians. Well, so, you know, to use your voice, um, it, it, it put simply, um, one of the ways to express your voice is at the voting booth, right? Coming out to vote and voting in every election, midterm elections, off-term elections, as well as presidential elections. If we don't do that, we've seen what the consequences are. If we don't express our will at the voting booth, then the special interests will be able to express their will by installing climate change denying lackeys for the fossil fuel industry, which is what we have right now running one of the two houses of Congress. Congress um, in the Senate. Uh, so voting is a big part of it, but using our voice in every way possible, speaking out, um, making climate change part of the daily conversation, uh, talking to our friends and family members and, uh, and, and classmates, who, whoever, um, to make sure this is something we're talking about constantly. It's on our minds, so it's on our minds when we vote. Um, it's on our minds when we participate in, in civil discourse. I just want to add to that that um, the younger generation is often a digital generation. And so thank you to all the people today in the audience, I've been watching your tweets come through, to keeping that conversation going and making it accessible to young people through the power of digital communication. Indeed, I recently joined Instagram uh, because <laughs> it's where all the cool kids are. Um, and so, you know, there are so many ways for us to participate in the conversation and social media increasingly is a way to reach a whole segment of the, the population that we wouldn't otherwise be reaching. Maggie. I'm Margaret Catley Carlson. I am a proud member of the Tyler Prize Selection Committee, uh, which is the executive committee, and uh, we're all feeling uh, even better about our decision. Um, I'm from uh, rainy British Columbia, which has already had its first forest fire this year. But I'm also pleased to tell you that we, uh, as of yesterday morning, the water restrictions went in for watering lawns so that are preventative measures against drought. But we have seven provincial premiers now that are declared enemies of carbon tax. So uh, you're not alone. We're not alone. Uh, it's, a, it's a continuing struggle, and it's picked up by the forces that Kelly was talking about. My question, you're probably wondering if I was going to get to it. <laughs> uh, Dr. Washington, I was surprised and somewhat startled to see at the top of your list geoengineering. Uh, I have, uh, in my I'm privileged to be schooled on a continuing basis by a lot of people, many of whom have said that isn't the way. We've, the, the only way we can do this is by the, the kind of grinding uh, towards political change and telling people they've got to change, particularly uh, par petrol use, uh, carbon production, etc. So I was quite interested to see that at the top of your list. Uh, can, can I give this opportunity for you to say what you're thinking about that? Thank okay. you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think I'm using the word geoengineering in a, in a, in a, a, a broader definition of it. <clears throat> Actually, I'm against most of the ideas of, of, of geoengineering. But on the ones that you hear most about are, are putting aerosols in the atmosphere. And, and having more reflection of the sun's rays. And it could end up with, with some pretty bad so, 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 so solutions. On, on last Saturday, I was at a conference in, at the American Philosophical Society. 
and Ernie Moniz, who was, who was uh, previous Secretary of, of uh, Energy <clears throat> under uh, uh, Obama, uh, pointed out that putting aerosols in the atmosphere isn't going to solve the problem of the oceans. On the oceans, they're getting more acidic and having more heat trapped. And so that's a bad idea. But there might be some other solutions of a, of a technological nature where geoengineering does make sense. But I would be very cautious about it. I would aim towards solutions that, that essentially took greenhouse gases out of the, out of the atmosphere. I think, I think that that ought, ought to be the first thing that we try to do. And uh, if we can't accomplish that, then maybe on there are some other solutions. But it isn't my favorite thing. I, I didn't mean for it to, to be top of the list. <laughs> it, it just came to mind. So on that's not, not my preferences. My preferences are basically cutting back emissions. Got a question from. I was going to add in a very quick thought there. There's one techno fix that would work and would be safe the, a time machine. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, um, I would just point out that in our book, The Madhouse Effect, our, our chapter on geoengineering was entitled Geoengineering or What Could Possibly Go Wrong? <laughs> Jonathan Patz from the Tyler Prize Executive Committee. Uh, thank you. And, and Jada, I did send some tweets, so I, I hope that I've makes me watching. young, right? <laughs> yes, yes. So I just want to follow up on Kelly's comment about not necessarily dividing between adaptation, which we need to do to prepare, and mitigation. And uh, you know, I've been working on the health issue, and when you think about trends in chronic disease, and you think about uh, when you burn coal that creates greenhouse gases, you also uh, create all those nasty pollutants that kill people. According to the World Health Organization, seven million people die every year from air pollution. On top of that, uh, a new, new studies are showing that sedentary lifestyle, from driving around too much and getting natural exercise out of our daily routine, is killing 5.3 million people every year. So we argue about the health benefits of a low carbon society. And, and I often talk about, regardless of one's views on climate science, we can all agree that this is good for society. So my question to you is, what's the right formula of scaring the pants off of people and <laughs> recognizing climate change, it's real, it's serious, it's now, and talking about no regrets policies, that this is, regardless of what you think about climate science, it's the greatest opportunity of our lifetimes. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I can tell you, my mantra these days, you know, and I already spoke to this, is urgency and agency. There is great urgency in acting now, but there are, you know, it, the problem is still solvable. Um, if you don't provide a path forward, if you simply uh, promote doom and gloom and, and despair um, and disillusionment, then you potentially lead people down the same path of inaction as outright denial of climate change. And to me, this is one of the greatest threats we face right now, is the notion that the problem you know, is, is beyond our control, um, the loss of hope, uh, the, that, that poses as great, if not a greater threat to climate action now than outright denial of uh, the science. And so we have to pay attention to that. We only have two minutes left for questions, so I'm going to ask both of you to ask your questions, and then I'll throw to the panel to answer them. Great. So uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, what became clear to me with respect fossil fuel uh, companies supporting adaptation and mitigation is that it does not cast blame on them. It does not fault them for it. It's how can they be a force for positive in the future, and when we put it at their door, there's also a legal question. Looking at it from their point of view, they may have some liability that they want to uh, avoid acknowledging. So if we are able to frame our conversation with them in a way that does not pose a legal and financial threat to them, they may be more uh, receptive to the science that we have 
and the ways forward. And so I'd like to put it to the panel, can we have a different tone to the conversation with quote unquote our opponents and maybe try and get them on the same side of the table as us because what we are looking for is the future for our children, our grandchildren, future generations, the rest of the planet. And if we can get them on that side of the table without finding fault, maybe they become our allies instead of our opponents. Great question. Dennis Baldock, UC Berkeley. Um, on one hand, society does a great job of supporting us as scientists to do research, to understand processes. And yet, we don't seem to act until there's a crisis. I mean, we've all known this since the 80s. Based on your experience with the climate system, when we have our next environmental crisis, how can we avoid going through the same scenario again and again and again? And how can we get science information to act sooner until waiting until catastrophe? Great question. So that question, and how can we get our opponents onto our side of the table? Any answers are welcome. <laughs> I'm happy to throw out some thoughts, and, um, and uh, so uh, you know we have to, uh, in my point, call out bad faith um, actors, um, uh, while encouraging um, and and providing support uh, for for those who do express an interest in, in positive engagement. Um, and you know there are fossil fuel companies that don't want to be villains, um, and 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 they'll tell you if if they had a clear price signal. If there's a carbon tax, if they know what the rules are, they will find a way to work within the confines of those rules. Even ExxonMobil had a shadow price on carbon um, of $60 per ton. It was twice as large as the Obama administration's official estimate of the, the price of emitting carbon. So what they'll tell you is if, if the rules are set, um, you know, then, then they, will, they will act within the confines of those rules. The problem right now is that we have politicians who are bought out by some of the bad faith actors, by, by, by some who don't genu genuinely want to be part of the problem. They just want to continue fossil fuel profits for as far into the future as they possibly can. And so I actually think a dual approach is necessary. Um, engaging those who have shown an interest, a willingness to be part of the solution, and calling out those who refuse to. Um, you know, the, and then I guess the, the other part of the question, uh, well, can I just, uh, I'll, I'll just yeah. pick up while you're thinking. I, I want to tie in also to, to Jonathan Patz's question, because I think the answer is you have to find opportunity. Um, it cannot be perceived as always a sacrifice. And I think there is a tremendous amount of opportunity here, whether it is you know, new clean energy jobs, whether it is development of new you know, high-tech industries, um, jobs associated with those industries, uh, new opportunities for, for students who are, um, you know, studying uh, sustainability. This, this is what most students are interested in. And so I think, you know, showing those pathways for opportunity uh, and progress is probably the most proactive way that we can bring everyone along. Dr. Washington, did you have one final thought? Well, I just <clears throat> want to point out, and I pointed it to do it in, in my slide about <clears throat> how much damage is being given to <clears throat> to solve this problem, or at least to keep it from not causing, uh, you know, damage. <clears throat> so, on that price is going to keep going up. We can be at three hundred billion in 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 our, you know sort of, I think, 1917, uh, I mean, 29. And so there's going to be over a trillion dollars at some point that this is going to cost us. And if it goes over to two trillion in 20 years, I would, I would think that we would say, hey, wait a minute, we got to do Enough. something. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think we should wait until things get bad before we start seriously doing something about it. We should do it early. <clears throat> and, and this is sort of a, uh, I remember uh, Susan Solomon, a very well-known scientist, estimated that every time you burn some fossil fuel, <clears throat> it, uh, a carbon dioxide molecule stays in, in the atmosphere of the order of 60 to 100 years or so. 
as its average lifetime. Well, that means we, um, we should have cut back much earlier than right now. <clears throat> and uh, if we don't do something, it's going to keep heating the, the planet for a long, long time. And I think Michael's shown good examples of that. So if we don't deal with this problem up front and not just wait until it gets worse and worse and worse and then do something about it, it's going to be much harder. Thank you. Thank you both very much for this really wonderful conversation, which we're not going to end right here. We have a chance to talk informally after this. And of course, it's impossible to make a summary in two seconds, which is what I have. But let me just say, <laughs> let me just say, bring out three words. Time, we are running out of time. There is urgency. Hope, there is agency, where there are plenty of opportunities. Kelly just started making that list. We can continue over coffee. There are plenty of opportunities to make this a, a much better place to live in, this planet that we share with nearly 10 billion others. And then finally, yes, we have a voice, as, as Mike Mann said. We have a voice and we have the responsibility to use it, all of us. And I think that's a, that's a really important message. We just have got to use that voice. And we have to be optimistic. It's, we cannot continue this gloom and doom language. Uh, there are solutions, and we are, we are capable. So let's, let's stop with that. And again, thank our laureates. And congratulations to both of you. And thank you for making us. <laughs>